uh, you know, we've identified uh, at least 135, uh, 18 of which fit uh, certain criteria that uh, that are currently available. Uh, so the, the, the framework is measurable. However, what we do know also is that uh, when we look at the recent UN Statistical Commission uh, ratings, uh, only five out of the 12 targets of Goal 16 were rated Tier 1, uh, which means that uh, that's good, that's good. That means that there's an, an existing methodology for measuring these things and that there's also uh, data available. However, uh, there was also seven of the 12 that were rated tier two, which means that yes, there is a methodology that's broadly accepted for measuring these things, but data is not necessarily that available. So there is a big data gap. gap. Fortunately, none of them were tier three, which would suggest that there's no prevailing guidance whatsoever uh, about measuring these, these goals, or these targets, I should say. Uh, the technical support team also only identified two AAA indicators, so they had a separate rating scheme. Uh, so it is suggestive that uh, in terms of the current stock of data, what we have now in 2015, uh, there are challenges. And I'm going to step through some of those really quickly. So the first one is availability. Uh, most of the data, as I've just pointed out, or at least seven of the 12, uh, don't exist. And even when you look at one of the AAA rated uh, indicators, homicide, uh, there are serious difficulties there too. Uh, we know that only, I think it's three out of four fragile states don't report their homicide data to the UNODC. Uh, we certainly know from the Global Peace Index research over the last nine years that homicide data uh, has moved around a lot. A lot of the estimates provided by uh, organisations like WHO uh, can change quite significantly. So even on something really quite fundamental like homicide, uh, the data is lacking. Uh, disaggregation, uh, this, obviously this has been talked about quite a lot uh, and it's particularly important for peace, conflict, uh, security, inclusive societies because we all know, uh, certainly from the literature, that horizontal inequalities within societies explain uh, a lot of the change. It's not just, it's, it's very good to know, uh, you know, uh, the numbers at a national level, but it's differences within a country which are really quite critical. Third thing is that uh, a lot of the targets are multi-dimensional. Uh, you can't measure them by just one or two uh, indicators. And so there is this natural tension and trade-off between a limited number of indicators uh, and a comprehensive set of indicators that actually measure what we're wanting to measure. Uh, and you know, if you look at goal 16, you look at 16.4, 16.7, uh, those are compound indicators which will require more than one uh, or two indicators to measure them adequately. Uh, even 16.1, if you look at the way it's worded, uh, is a compound indicator. So significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere. Uh, what do we mean by violence? That could mean conflict deaths, it could mean interpersonal violence, it could mean violence against women. Uh, there's many categories of violence that, we're talking, that we could talk about there and measure. And of course, it doesn't take uh, much to point out that a lot of the indicators require quite deep statistical capacity. Uh, even a lot of uh, high income countries uh, don't do uh, regular victimization surveys. So the idea that countries that currently have poor capacity doing these things uh, is, is obviously a, a serious challenge. And finally, the political viability of some of the goals. Um, I think that's, that's the obvious standout uh, challenge. 16.10 uh, is, is quite a good example of that. So I think the point here is that uh, the door just needs to be left open for some forms of uh, third party and expert assessment uh, to somehow work with the official administrative sources. Uh, and certainly Patrick did refer to that in his comments. I'm just going to step through some examples of some really top line third party uh, related data collection uh, that 
has been going on for many years and is currently going on and is relatively new. Uh, many people might be familiar with Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, uh, perceptions data on perceptions of corruption in a whole range of institutions, uh, but also questions on bribery. <laughs> Uh, and Transparency International have been doing this for quite some time with relatively little controversy. Uh, there's quite a nice data set uh, there already. Uh, World Justice Project, uh, looking at a multi-dimensional measure of rule of law. Uh, that's uh, survey-based uh, data covering 91 countries, uh, quite a big initiative. Uh, and then there's more innovative new initiatives, um, Cordaid, the, the the Dutch uh, development organisations just developed a thing called uh, Flourishing Community Index, which is a very interesting and innovative approach to surveying on the ground, asking people uh, for, for narratives about their situation, uh, rather than asking direct perception-based questions. Uh, and then there's a, the host of event databases like ACLED, uh, like the Global Terrorism Database, uh, which use uh, machine coding and, and coding of media sources uh, to generate data from uh, these third party sources. And these can be very accurate. And I'll talk a little bit about those. And then there's just technological innovations around SMS, which uh, you know, it really has a lot of uh, promise as well. So really simply, I mean, there are strengths to these third party sources. They're innovative, they're, rel they're cheap. They're a lot cheaper than uh, uh, official administrative data. Uh, and they're timely and practical. Uh, of course, they don't always adhere to the SMART criteria, uh, the criteria that you know, we want to see for indicators. And they're not always at a statistical standard. And I think that's where one of the questions uh, lies for expert and third party assessment is do we actually need some of these data sources to adhere to administrative standards? Um, in some ways, sometimes we just need indicators. We need rough indicators to broadly indicate whether or not countries are going forwards or backwards on particular measures. Uh, I'm going to step through very quickly uh, a couple of uh, examples of expert qualitative data that is currently existing that, say, we generate at the, with the Global Peace Index. Uh, there's a, a, an indicator on violent crime that we generate, uh, uh, scoring countries from 1 to 5. Uh, that would inform 16.1. Uh, there's similar indicators at the Mo Hebrew Index. Uh, the Economist generates uh, other qualitative indicators. Um, and these, these have been mentioned in the virtual network. Uh, the the uh, International Budget Partnership Open Budget Index is another one. Um, so there is existing data there that has been developed for many years relatively uncontroversially uh, with broad buy-in uh, that currently exists that can be used. I'm just going to show one example of an indicator that is a qualitative indicator measuring something that is a little bit politically sensitive, uh, the political terror scale, which is a, uh, an indicator put together by uh, an American university uh, who code countries based on the level of political violence within their country. So uh, they use the Amnesty International Human Rights uh, Report uh, and the US State Department Human Rights Report to code countries based on their levels of political terror. Uh, and again, that's, that's an existing data set that it, it goes back more than 10 years. Uh, as I said before, there's event databases. This is just an example of one. Uh, this is from the Global Terrorism Index, which we put together. Uh, very detailed data, geocoded uh, data on uh, the number of lives lost from terrorist incidents, uh, the level of property damage, uh, the perpetrators, the weapons involved, uh, quite detailed stuff. Uh, it's available for more than 15 years worth of uh, time series, and uh, it's updated every year. And it's done so relatively cheaply. Um, one example of uh, a hybrid approach is a project that uh, we worked on uh, earlier this year with uh, INAGI, the Mexican Statistical Agency, on measuring peace in Mexico. Uh, uh, the Mexico Peace Index looked at negative peace at the subnational level as well as positive peace at the subnational level. And uh, thanks. And uh, essentially, uh, I think that's a good example of a hybrid collaboration. Uh, 
INAGI is a constitutionally uh, independent uh, statistical agency, highly professional, uh, and we could work quite closely with them in, gener in, in putting some of their data into a composite measure uh, to use for advocacy. So some really top line uh, points on how expert and third party data can uh, help and fill the gap for goal 16. So the first is just in the absence of administrative data, uh, there's data out there that we can use. Pretty obvious point. Uh, it can address the need for composite measures if they are needed and maybe they're not a part of the, the official uh, universal indicators. Maybe they get used at a, at a country specific level. Uh, there are technical reasons why expert assessments may work better. Uh, so, for instance, on indicators where uh, that need, whereby you need to uh, compare across uh, countries in a harmonised way on a transnational issue, it might be difficult for an NSO to do that. Uh, so, uh, illicit flows is a good example. Uh, there's context-specific reasons. Uh, so. In a, in a country that is suffering from significant levels of violence, it's not really reasonable to think that they're going to be able to continue to generate statistics. And uh, there are good examples of third party uh, attempts at this. The Iraq body count is, is one of them, counting the number of violent deaths uh, in, that, in the Iraqi conflict. And then there's just emergent technologies that we need to take account of. Uh, I've referred to some of these before, uh, but these are quite innovative and they are developing all the time and they can uh, quickly supplant uh, administrative sources and, and generate data very quickly and, and cheaply. Uh, accountability is an important one uh, and as I've said, I think there might be space to inform those supplementary uh, country specific indicators. So just in conclusion, just some really top line points on uh, how better peace building, better goal 16 data could help things outside of the, just measuring the framework itself. Uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly scope to better increase uh, early warning for governments uh, to indicate where are the pressure points, uh, which things are getting better, which things are getting worse. Uh, for business, uh, there's large scope to help investors uh, better price country risk. Uh, that's a broader, more important point for development, I think, that it's very difficult for a lot of fragile states to attract uh, foreign direct investment if, there is no, if a risk premium can't be applied to a country. So if there's better data on, on what's going on, uh, then at least an investor can price the risk, which means at least investment can happen. Uh, Policy makers, obviously practitioners, uh, you know, the holy grail of peace building would be some kind of cost benefit uh, assessment methodology where you could work out the benefit of particular interventions. And I think over time, uh, the goal would be that you could shift the focus to long-term planning. Uh, donors, it's a point that gets often said, too focused on uh, three to four year time periods. Uh, by generating this data and understanding the, the pace at which it changes, we can start to shift the focus to a long long term, 10, 15 years, because that's how long these institutions sometimes take uh, to improve. And of course, just generating better data for uh, targeting and allocation of resources and uh, a better evidence base. So conscious of the time, Sarah, I'll leave my comments there and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. That, that was a very interesting um, presentation, which was a very interesting contrast to the presentation before, uh, providing a very different view of, of how we might measure governance and peace building um, aspects. And, and I have a lot of questions about use by policymakers and so on, but I'm sure others do too. So uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Is there anybody who would like to start? There's one over there. Let's take a round. One over there. And Knut at the front. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, as always, it was extremely interesting, Daniel. Um, I two very different questions. One, uh, uh, simple and easy. So one concern, obviously, with expert assessment is the issue of uh, consistency over time. So to make sure that you actually get good time series, which is 
you'd think especially crucial for uh, something like a long-run SDG process. So uh, uh, what's your thoughts on that? And then second, um, you talked about uh, the risk for investors and business risk uh, on your concluding slide. And um, so one thing we know, for example, is that um, if you look at the borrowing costs for African countries and you compare African countries to many uh, other countries that have similar debt levels, etc., Africa, uh, uh, Afri African countries are charged much higher uh, interest rates. So investors are building in a, a political risk factor that is probably connected to conflict uh, risk that is a heavy premium on, on any type of business uh, going on in, in, in Africa. And um, my general sense is that many of these political risk analysis groups are, are uh, exaggerating the risk of conflict in many Africans or in many uh, developing uh, countries in general. And is, is, there, is this an issue where you think uh, uh, the approaches you're dealing with could actually make a difference? Thank you. And the second question was over there, wasn't it? <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher Wilson from the Engine Room. Um, I, uh, I, I uh, couldn't help but notice that uh, the way you described uh, third-party expert uh, data collection initiatives was was almost almost exclusively about international third parties doing comparative work. Um, and I think one of the other uh, challenges there and potential weaknesses is that can often be perceived as uh, imposed from outside by actors that don't understand the national context, which can have important consequences for how that data gets fed into policy processes and, and ownership. Um, and I also noticed that uh, though we perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, fortunately haven't heard the term data revolution today, there has been some reference to the fact that there's been a tremendous proliferation of data collection and data generation by citizens and by civil society in countries. Um, and, and we haven't had a chance to really reflect on how that kind of data might be incorporated into these kinds of measurement processes. Often that kind of data isn't representative, it's not statistical, doesn't meet those kinds of standards, but I think there's also quite a bit of opportunity to think about how it can play complementary roles, either for quality control, for focusing on disaggregated uh, uh, analysis, or by uh, identifying areas where, where further data collection is necessary. Um, so I'd like to hear everybody's comments on that. Thank you. And then there was in the front, and after we'll go to Alex. Uh, this is Knut uh, I work for the UN in Timor Leste. Um, to, uh, can I sneak in two questions very quickly? Yes. The, uh, um, first, thank you very much to all the presenters. It's really great to, to see this work. Um, on, the, um, on the last presentation, uh, one technical one, which is you, you showed eight uh, pillars. And only I was sort of missing uh, poverty as a, as a prominent factor in, in uh, supporting peace. As a pillar, you talked about resource distribution, but that's a bit different from poverty in, in general. If you could reflect why a little bit on why poverty is not more prominently shown in, in those pillars. Um, the other question is a bit linked to the last question: the uh, ownership of uh, of host countries. It's very often you will see that uh, host countries will take um, unfavorable external statistics as something threatening rather than something that can be used for policy making and instead of having a constructive policy making work you would see a defensive reaction trying to prove why these external statistics are not uh, valid uh, how, how would you propose to to bridge that uh, that uh, gap thank you Thank you. And then last question actually from Alex. Uh, hi, thanks so much uh, for a really interesting presentation. Um, I work for CARE Norway. My name's Alexandra. Um, I'm coordinating a program on 1325 UNSCR Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, and uh, my question relates to the relationship of gender equality uh, to peace and specifically how in your work you're addressing that, what kinds of measures you're using and, um, and whether you're looking at some of the work that's um, taking place within the sub sort of WPS community, the global indicators that are being advanced um, that will be reviewed uh, come October. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. 
Great, thanks. Uh, so, Horvath's question first. Um, how do we ensure consistency over time on an expert process uh, for indicated development? It's a good question. What's really critical, I think, is uh, the way in which expert surveys are constructed. So, really practically, they need to be based on very clear criteria and usually some kind of binary criteria that is not open to uh, interpretation. So over time when experts change and when there's new people come in, uh, it, the, you know, the opinions don't change. They're not subjected to those uh, objective kind of subjective uh, beliefs. Uh, in terms of the question about business risk and borrowing costs, it is a very interesting point to make that a lot of uh, fragile states, especially African countries, have these uh, higher interest rates and the risk premium is already priced in. Uh, last year we convened a conference uh, with fund managers and with practitioners to talk about this question partly. And what we learned is that the way in which a lot of big uh, funds actually do uh, risk assessment is really quite crude. A lot of the tools that are out there are around trying to de define political risk are really quite poor. And the way in which people do investment is still often through personal relationships. So for instance, you know, a big fund might want to invest in uh, a particular telecommunications company in a fragile state because they know someone on the board. They know nothing about the DRC. They just know, oh, that's bad, um, but at least I know this person on the board. So the, the, the way in which risk is being done uh, is not very effective. And if we can provide better data, then the, then ideally the risk premiums will go down because better data is better than nothing, which is what we have at the moment. Um, the premiums are high because there is no data. And I think what's worse is that because there is no data, nowhere near enough investment actually happens. I think that's the real big problem. Uh, to Chris's question about just focusing on international uh, third party uh, examples. Uh, it's a very well taken point, probably remiss of me not to include some locally derived ones. Um, I think, Sarah, when we're thinking about trying to answer your question about uh, what, you know, what have we learned from some of these initiatives and how they made more inclusive societies, I think the very best examples are the ones that have happened at the local level. Uh, you know, and it's very difficult at this early stage to know how effective some of them are because you know, they haven't been around that long in terms of, you know, if we're thinking of Ushahidi or um, you know, some of the other peace tech uh, developments. Um, and so, and it's also very difficult to tra track the causality between uh, you know, lots of these little initiatives and what actually happens at the at the national level. I think there's a really good example of um, uh, a project called Map Kibera, which was uh, locally led. Uh, uh, people who got together to map the Kibera slums, uh, where almost one million people live. Uh, previously, there's no map of this area, and so the government was very appreciative of that because they could begin to understand where services need to be delivered and uh, where the gaps are in water and sanitation. So that's a really practical example of, uh, of a locally-led uh, data project that's actually had a, an impact in terms of delivering better uh, services. Um, I think in terms of the data revolution, uh, yes, we haven't mentioned that. Uh, I, I think it's just important to point out and when we're asking this question about what can donors do, uh, that statistical capacity is not currently being funded. Um, or it is, it's just not very much. I think it's something like 0.16% of ODA. Uh, so donors aren't giving the money to generate data. And uh, there are plenty of examples of uh, well, there's a couple of examples. Uh, I think the demographic health survey is a very good example of, uh, of funding statistical capacity, uh, generating data, but also generating capacity. Um, and a lot of that data, incidentally, uh, the most recent demographic health survey has quite detailed questions on domestic violence, for instance, and it's done, it's, it's done this without much controversy. Uh, and statistical officers are now rolling this out. And so we have this quite detailed data on uh, domestic violence for you know, more than 50 countries. Um, and it's 
as far as I can tell, not really caused too much uh, political concern. Uh, to the question, uh, uh, the technical question, just about uh, the pillars and the and poverty. Uh, Poverty is, you know, we do look at that in the human capital pillar. So, if you if you're in poverty, there's not much human capital. Um, but when you're looking at that pillar and that framework, what we're trying to do is actually think about the, the factors that statistically lead to violence. And uh, I think the jury is very much out in terms of what the literature says about poverty and violence. People in poverty don't necessarily become violent. Um, and I think that's an important uh, point to make. Uh, in terms of ownership um, and you know the, the sort of concern about that, I think I think it's important to, to note that uh, it, it's not always the case that these third party or expert processes will turn up bad news. Sometimes, you know, if governments will be very happy when uh, a third party points out that things are getting much better, and invariably they are getting better. Um, and I think we sometimes forget that that there are good stories, and uh, you know, that, that positive change can happen. Um, I think. Uh, it, there are examples of third parties helping build capacity and working very closely with NSA. I think Afrobarometer is a really good example of that. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think going back to a comment I made, I think the it's in I think it's in Goal 17. There's a there's a target around uh, statistical independence and the independent independence of statistical agencies to generate data. I think that's a really important one um, uh, because without that one uh, you can imagine that it's very difficult for a lot of these other processes to work without political interference. Um, and then in the second, I think that was it, wasn't it? Um, and then to Alexandra's question um, just about gender and peace. Um, that is something that we've looked at quite a lot. Uh, it's just a fact that countries with less gender equality tend to be less peaceful. Uh, it's a cyclical process. Uh, low gender equality leads to violence. Violence it, it, it leads to low gender equality. Um, I think in terms of the data for gender equality, I think, um, and especially gender-based violence, uh, there's, there's a real need to develop more of it. <laughs> Uh, a really basic uh, question and this is something that we're interested in working on at the moment is if you want to see a list of the countries by uh, the countries that have the most amount of gender based violence in the world and the ones that have the least uh, you, you can Wikipedia and you, you, you actually get Australia and Sweden at the top and of course we know that's uh, we know the reason for that because uh, women report violence in in these places and that's a good thing there's norms around that and people uh, you know there's trust in the police to, to do so um, even though we know that there's also a lot of under reporting uh, but for the rest of the world pretty much we really don't have any data so on a really elementary thing like gender-based violence um, there is no information, and I think uh, the example of what happened in DRC is a pretty good example. Um, in 2007, uh, I think the UN mission estimated that uh, during the conflict there was something like 4,000 rapes that happened and that were mostly perpetrated by uh, soldiers. Uh, that same year, uh, Demographic Health Survey did a survey, uh, asked, you know, they, they rolled out their domestic violence survey and they found that there were over 437,000 rapes. Uh, and so the UN mission number comp dramatically underestimated the actual uh, magnitude. And what was worse is that uh, the policy focus was very much on violence against women in wartime. And yes, that is a problem, but what the DHS survey found is that the great majority of this uh, was actually happening within the home. And so I think that's a really good example of how when we get this better data, we can start to identify what are the real key touch points and you know what we need to do around policy. So I think that was it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to wrap up the morning session now, but I'd like first to thank Daniel for his, his very interesting presentation and, and all the speakers for their presentation. I
I think there's a few more issues that came out of that one that we might want to take into the afternoon, um, including this issue around ownership um, and how that affects legitimacy and how that affects the ability to feed into local policy. We're going to break for lunch now. Um, you did find on your tables when you came in a, a questionnaire about uh, the OGC and what you might like to see, uh, uh, types of things we might like to work with you on in the future. If you would like to fill that in and just leave it at the table at the back, that would be great, or give it to me or any of the other OGC staff who are here. We're going to reconvene at 12.15 promptly. We will start the discussions at 12.15. Um, uh, with some discussants and then a plenary discussion, after which Helen Clark and the Foreign Minister will rejoin us to formally open the centre. So the timing this afternoon is very tight. I would ask you to take a quick lunch break. You will find some food outside, I believe, and I look forward to seeing you back here at 12.15. Thank you.